All right, welcome back sixth grade. We're gonna continue on with chapter May from Wednesday Wars. And as usual, thank you Scholastic for letting us do read alouds right now while we're doing remote learning uh, by Gary Schmidt. So just so you know, sixth grade, I posted a video that links you to YouTube where you can actually watch the uh, clip of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, the funeral procession there are other clips where you can actually watch the ceremony, but I picked the clip where you can watch his casket being drawn by two mules um, up the street with all kinds of people um, walking with them. Because that's the same video clip that Holling and Merrill Lee in the previous chapter in April uh, watched and other people in the news watched um, this very humble procession of such an influential person in the late 60s. Uh, if you don't know much about Martin Luther King Jr., um, hopefully the speech, I Have a Dream, rings a bell. If not, we're going to read it. I guarantee you we're going to pull that out next year and we're going to study it. We're going to look at it. It's an amazing piece of, of writing. Um, an amazing public speaker, very humble, very passionate. Uh, peaceful protest was his um, method to fight back against the racism of that time and before and ongoing. I mean, we see stuff in the news that shows that we, we have a lot of work to do, right? With racism and how we treat other people. Uh, but he was, he was a voice for people who were being mistreated, uh, African-Americans who are not being given the rights that they deserve, right? Just for being human beings, just like everybody else. So he was activist, he was protesting, but not violent, right? It was peaceful protests, it was speeches. Um, and in 1968, um, he was assassinated. Um, which wasn't long after JFK was assassinated. So this was an era of a lot of unrest, right? Where a lot of things were going wrong in the country. People were disagreeing about the war. There was racial tensions. There were assassinations. There were, I mean, it was just an ugly period in U.S. history. I mean, there, there are plenty along the way, but this, the late 60s was a big eruption of all of this tension. So I put that video clip on there so you could see that. Um, I also put on a video clip. This one, we're going to talk a little bit about more about Vietnam and Russia and um, dropping atomic bombs, which at our school, you know, we do tornado drills, we do fire drills, we do those kinds of practices. Um, they did those as well, but they also did atomic bomb drills, which they talk about, you know, duck and cover. So I put a video on Google Classroom that you can watch. That's the, the actual video from the 60s that they showed to students and showed to kids. And it had this really cute cartoon and song, Duck and Cover, um, to teach kids that if an atomic bomb was going to drop on you, you got under your desk. And if you actually think about it, if an atomic bomb is going to drop on you, being under a desk isn't that helpful. But it was something that they were teaching kids. It's something they practiced, just like we do fire drills, just like we do tornado drills. They did atomic bomb drills as well. So I posted those two videos. So hopefully you get a chance to look at them. They are definitely interesting. But one for historical purposes and the other just because it's different. And you might be singing the duck and cover song with uh, the turtle that's the cartoon character there. But we're going to continue with May. May. So we have two chapters remaining, May and June. Uh, 208 in this particular copy. So if you have the same text at home, 208, or you may just watch, listen along. Uh, track meet went well. He ended up with a smooch from Merrill Lee, which is not allowed because he's not 30, but we'll chalk it up to the 60s because you guys know better. <laughs> so May. At the beginning of May, Mrs. Sidman told us during morning announcements that this would be Atomic Bomb Awareness Month. You might think this would have caught, of our caught our attention, but it didn't. Every May brings Atomic Bomb Awareness Month to Camillo Junior High, right after the greening grass and the yellowing forsythia. It's so predictable, it's hard to keep up with the enthusiasm. But Mrs. Sidman had clearly determined that this year, maybe because it was her first year as principal, she would give us the big M, remember that previous chapter, for motivation. Since we are living so very close to New York City, she said, Camillo Junior High is certainly a likely target for an atomic bomb if the Soviet Union should ever choose to attack. It behooves us to be prepared. We will begin a series of atomic bombs drills this afternoon. 
When the sirens blow, I expect everyone to follow our government's drill procedures precisely. Behooves, said Danny. Becomes necessary, Mr. Hupfer, said Mrs. Baker, as in it behooves us to raise our hand before we ask a question. Now, can anyone tell me what the adjectival form would be? Teachers, they can't help it. I don't think any of us really believed that Leno Lenoid Brisnoff was sitting in the deep dark rooms of the Kremlin plotting to drop an atomic bomb on Camillo Jr. High. But even so, there was an eerie feeling when the sirens began to wail just before the end of the day. And Mrs. Baker stood up from her desk and clapped her hands at us. I'm pretty sure she was trying not to roll her eyes. She told us to scrunch under her desks. No talking. She told us to put our hands over our ears, over our heads. Absolute silence. And she told us to breathe quietly and evenly, really, as if we'd forgotten how. When we were finally settled, and all of this took a while since Mary Lee wouldn't sit on the floor until she spread some clean poster board first, Mrs. Baker opened the classroom door, pulled the shades down on all the windows, turned the lights off, then patrolled up and down the aisles. I bet she was rolling her eyes then. It doesn't take very long when you're scrunched under your desk with your hands over your head, breathing quietly and evenly to feel three things. One, that your spine is not meant to bend like this. Two, that if you don't stretch your legs out soon, they're going to spasm and you'll lose all feeling and probably not be able to walk for a long time. Three, you are going to throw up any minute because you can see the wads of bazooka bubblegum that Danny Hopfer has been sticking under his desk all year, which now look like little wasp nests hanging down. But... We followed the government's drill procedures precisely and stayed under our desks for 18 minutes until the wind would have whisked away the first waves of airborne radioactive particles and the blast of burning air would have passed overhead and the mushroom cloud would no longer be expanding and every living thing would be incinerated except for us because we were scrunched under our gummy desks with our hands over our heads, breathing quietly and evenly. We got up when Mrs. Sidman peered into our classroom and told us we had done quite well, that we were beginning to be prepared. I guess that was sort of comforting, and I bet it made Leonard Leonoid Bresnov tremble in his boots, especially if you really did have it in for Camillo Junior High. Actually, there seemed to be a whole lot of people who needed comfort these days, especially the eighth grade varsity runners who were taking the Salisbury Park race too personally. I mean, our whole team came in before anyone else on the other Long Island teams. Mr. Quattrini had given us two practices off to celebrate. We got our team picture in the hometown chronicle holding the trophy. What more do you want? Apparently, a whole lot. Let me tell you, you don't want to open your gym locker and find someone has squirted shaving cream into it. And you don't want to find that the shoelaces on your sneakers are missing or tied up in knots that take about a day and a half to get out or that your shorts are hanging from the rafters in the gym ceiling, or that they're sopping wet, and not from water in the sink. I think something must happen when you get into the eighth grade, like Doug Switek's brother's gene switches on and you become a jerk. Which may have been Hamlet, Prince of Denmark's problem. But besides having a name that made him sound like a breakfast special at Sunnyside Morning Restaurant, something between a ham slice and a three-egg omelet, didn't have the smarts to figure out that when someone takes the trouble to come back from beyond the grave to tell you he's been murdered, it's probably behooveful to pay attention, which is the adjectival form. Anyway, I stayed way behind the eighth grade packet in practice these days. I didn't spit anymore, but I figured that if I tried to pass them, they would probably leave my bloody body on the side of the road. But the eighth grade varsity runners weren't anything compared with my father who really needed some comfort because of what the Hometown Chronicle reported on May 3. Here's the headline. Local architect firm to renovate Yankee Stadium. I guess I don't have to tell you that the local architect firm was not Hood Hood and Associates. It was Kowalski and Associates. The story had words like these, multi-million dollar job, three-year commitment, highest visibility of any local firm, and Kowalski, a sure bet for the Chamber of Commerce businessman of 1968, all of which made the job for the new junior high school seem pretty tame by comparison. Suppers were very quiet for a few days. My father mostly concentrated on his lima beans until my sister pointed out that a steady diet of lima beans had already killed lab rats and was probably killing us. See? 
said my father looking up. You can learn all sorts of useful and valuable information without going to Columbia University. And that's good, because no one is going to Columbia University these days, are they? And no one will, since they're going to shut down classes because their students think that life is all about standing on the streets and chanting slogans instead of working hard and finally getting what they deserve. I am going to Columbia University as soon as I finish high school. You will be going to Columbia University when lima beans fly. Which was the moment that my sister demonstrated that lima beans can fly across the table, past my face, mostly, and onto the scale model of the new junior high school. Toads, beetles, bats. That was the last night my sister came down for supper. Every night afterward, she'd take her plate and eat in her room alone with the beetles and their yellow submarine. Probably, she didn't eat a single lima bean. Still, my father did find some sort of comfort that he wanted. The day after the supper of the flying lima beans, he came home with a brand new Ford Mustang convertible. It was white with genuine red leather interior. It had an AM FM radio. Really? It had a 390 big block V8 engine and a stick shift four speed transmission that could take you up to 160 miles per hour if you wanted. The chrome glittering across the front grille gleamed so brightly, you had to take your eyes away from it when the sun struck it right. It made a sound like power. It was, all in all, the most beautiful, perfect car that God ever allowed to be made on earth. My father and mother went for a drive in it every evening, right after Walter Cronkite was finished. They backed out of the driveway slowly, my mother waving at us and laughing as if she was in high school and going on a date. My father would be concentrating on the road since he didn't want his Ford Mustang to be near any other car that might come too close and spatter a pebble up at the chrome. During the day, he left it parked in the driveway, probably because he thought it would look just right in front of the perfect house, and probably so that Chit wouldn't park his yellow VW bug there. My father wanted to be sure people didn't think he was driving a bug with pink and orange flower decals, which no one in the running for Chamber of Commerce businessman of 1968 would drive. At night, after it was too dark to see how wonderful the Ford Mustang looked in front of the perfect house, he pulled the station wagon out from the garage, drove the Mustang in away from the nighttime dew, and parked the station wagon in the driveway. He did love the Mustang. He watched over it, like his reputation. I dreamed of driving that car. The AM FM radio on, the top down, the wind big and loud. Left hand curved around the wheel, right hand playing on the shift, seeing if it really could reach 160 miles an hour on a long straight stretch. But I wonder if even the brand new Ford Mustang convertible comforted my father the night my sister left for California to find herself. We didn't discover anything until the next morning. My father was already at work when my mother went to wake my sister up and found only a note on her bed. By the time you read this, I'll be somewhere on the highway headed toward the Rocky Mountains with Chit. I'll call when I can. Don't worry. And don't try to follow me. That was all she wrote. For supper, my mother set only three places. She did not cook lima beans. She did not say anything while my father swore up and down that my sister made her own decision and that she would have to live with it and he wouldn't send her a dime, not a dime if she got into trouble and she better not call him first because he was likely to tell her exactly what he thought of her. Didn't she realize this didn't help his business reputation or his chances for Chamber of Commerce businessman of 1968 with that creep Kowalski was trying to steal from him? And why weren't there any lima beans for supper tonight? That evening, my mother did not go for a drive in the Mustang with my father. He drove off alone, without even listening to Walter Cronkite. And I did the dishes alone. And I wondered what it was like for my sister, cramped into a yellow Volkswagen Beetle with the folded and hairy chit, heading toward the sunset, going off to find herself. I wondered exactly what she would find. And I wondered if it would be a whole lot better going off to find yourself in a brand new Ford Mustang convertible with a 390 big block engine. So in some ways, dad and sister are not so different. Dad's having kind of a midlife crisis, buys himself a really expensive car. Sister is not happy at home. She takes off. Right? Their family is, is falling apart right underneath them. 
Our house grew quiet and still. My father stopped watering the azalea bushes along the front walk, and they drooped and began to die. There was no music from upstairs. There were no more lima beans, which, let me tell you, didn't cause me much sorrow, but there was hardly any talk. And what words there were felt careful, since there was a whole lot that no one wanted to talk about. Sort of like things between Claudius, Gertrude, and Hamlet. You can't say a lot if the whole time you're wondering if everyone else is really thinking about the thing you're not supposed to be thinking about because you're afraid of the thing you're not supposed to be thinking about is what's going to harrow you with fear and wonder or something like that. As you can tell, Mrs. Baker had me reading the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark for May, which I think was punishment for taking off April. This was slow stuff. Even Romeo had it over Hamlet. The ghost was okay, the grave diggers, but when you write about characters who talk too much, the only way to show that they talk too much is to make them talk too much. That gets annoying. So anytime I saw a speech by Hamlet or Polonius or, well, just about anybody, I skipped over it pretty quickly. And I don't think I missed a thing. I shared this insight into reading Shakespeare with Meryl Lee, who, by the way, was not going to move, who now knew who Mickey Mantle was and who had memorized the entire Yankee roster. I don't think that's a good way to read something, said Meryl Lee. Why not? You can't just skip the boring parts. Of course I can skip the boring parts. Well, how do you know if they're boring if you don't read them? I can tell. Then you can't say you've read the whole play. I think I can still live a happy life, Merrily, even if I don't read the boring parts of Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Who knows, she said. Maybe you can't. I tried my insight into reading Shakespeare on Mrs. Baker. I see, said Mrs. Baker. But doesn't this play in particular pose a problem for your new method, Mr. Hood Hood? What problem? That there are no boring parts in this, Shakespeare's greatest play of all. And she looked at me. She almost folded her arms across her chest, but stopped at the last second. I guess that would be a problem, I said. Read it all, said Mrs. Baker, even Polonius. And if it gets boring, it won't get boring. It already is boring then I suggest you start again. This is the story of a son who is asked to take vengeance for what happened to his father, who had been dreadfully murdered, but he's not sure he can trust anyone in his family. What might you do in, a, in such a situation? I'd run the murderer over with a Ford Mustang. Short of that colorful extremity. Well, I said, I guess I'd start by looking around for someone to trust. Mrs. Baker nodded. Now, she said, begin the play. The next day, right after lunch recess, the atomic bomb sirens wailed again in Camillo Junior High. I guess Leonoid Bresnov was still at it. We scrunched under our desks again, put our hands over our heads. No talking. Absolute silence. Breathe quietly and evenly. This rots, said Danny Hupfer. No talking, please, said Mrs. Baker. I have a question, said Danny. After the drill, said Mrs. Baker. Well, this is important, said Danny. Mrs. Baker sighed. What is it, Mr. Hupfer? Isn't it dangerous for you not to be under your desk? Thank you for your concern. I will take the risk. But suppose an atomic bomb was really coming down right on top of Camillo Junior High. Then, said Mrs. Baker, we wouldn't have to diagram any sentences for the rest of the afternoon. It might be worth it, whispered Danny. If Danny sounded a little snippy, you have to realize his bar mitzvah was coming up, and he was more terrified of his bar mitzvah than an atomic bomb. He was really touchy about it, even when you tried to encourage him. So bar mitzvah is when a Jewish boy turns 13, <clears throat> and they celebrate him becoming a man. So they have a big ceremony, they have to read the Torah in Hebrew, and they've got to do it beautifully with no things. So there's lots of things to memorize, lots of things to practice. It's super stressful. And then you get to have a big party, but the ceremony, all your family comes. It's a big deal and you can't mess up and a lot of stress. So Danny is a little stressed out at the moment. So he's kind of snippy at everybody. You've been taking Hebrew classes for, for this for a year, I'd remind him. Years. So how hard can it be? How hard can it be? 
How hard can it be? How hard do you think it would be if your rabbi is standing right next to you and your parents and grandparents are watching you along with every aunt and uncle and cousin and second cousin, even some you've never met, and two eight grants who immigrated from Poland in 1913, and a great uncle who escaped the Tsar, and every one of them is looking at you and crying and waiting for you to make a mistake, and if you do, they'll holler out the right word and stare at you like you shame the whole family, and they'll never ever be able to walk into the synagogue again. How hard do you think it could be? Maybe it would help, I said. If you scrunched under your desk and breathed quietly and evenly, maybe it would help, he said, if I stuck this gum up your nose. Merrily and my tie and I decided we should find better ways to help Danny than putting gum up our noses. So every lunch at, rec at recess for most of May, we sat inside and listened to him recite what he was going to read at the service, even though we had no idea if the words he was saying were coming out right or not. And at the end of every recess, he would always run, ready, was always ready to run away to California. I can't do this, he'd say. You can do this, we'd say. I don't want to do this, he'd say. You want to do this, we'd say. I don't even care about this, he'd say. You care about this, you'd say. We'd say. It was sort of like a play, which, as you know, I have some experience at. And that's how it went, every day. So you can see how that didn't put us into the mood for atomic bomb drills, which was too bad, since in May there wasn't a single day that went by that we didn't practice for atomic bomb. Merrily and Mai Tai spent most of the time under the desk softly singing the music from Camelot, which Mrs. Baker didn't seem to mind, even though there was supposed to be absolute quiet. Danny practices Hebrew, which is hard to do when you have your hands clasped over your head. I threw spitballs at him, which is even harder to do when you have your hands clasped over your head. And Duck Swiatek went to sleep. And when he went to sleep, he really went to sleep. And let me tell you, you don't want to be in the seventh grade and have people hear you snore. What you hear when you wake up is humiliating. Not as humiliating as yellow tights with feathers on the butt, but humiliating enough. One of the atomic bomb drills came on a Wednesday afternoon, about halfway through the month. Right about the time the Yankees were batting 187 as a team, were stuck in ninth place again, just like last year. It was one of those hot, still days that come before summer that remind you what July is going to be like. When I scrunched under the desk, I could feel immediately that the air there was kind of heavy and steamy, and that I was going to start sweating pretty quickly, which I did. This was really unfair, since everyone else had already left for Temple Bethel or St. Adelbert's. I think Mrs. Baker probably agreed. This, Mr. Hood Hood, is ridiculous, she said. And she wasn't even scrunched under her desk. I leaned out from under my desk, my hands still clasped over my head. Mrs. Baker, I said, even though I wasn't supposed to be, I was supposed to be breathing quietly. Yes, she said. Would you mind not calling me Mr. Hood Hood? It sounds like you're talking to my father. Mrs. Baker sat down at Danny's desk. You're still angry about opening day, she said. I just don't want to be him already. But you have similarities. Marilee showed me your, showed me your drawing. It was wonderful. Anyone can see you have the soul of an architect. Maybe, I said. But you want to decide for yourself, said Mrs. Baker. I nodded. I wanted to decide for myself. And you're afraid, said Mrs. Baker, that you won't get the chance. That I won't get the chance to see what I can do with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, I said. Not many people do, said Mrs. Baker. Even Hamlet waited too long. The sirens wailed as if to remind us that we're supposed to be absolute silence. This is ridiculous, Mrs. Baker said again. Here we are in the middle of Act 3, and we have to leave Shakespeare to curl up underneath a desk for an atomic bomb drill, which is, by my count, the 16th time you've practiced curling beneath a desk. If anyone needs to practice curling beneath a desk, she rolled her eyes. Then she seemed to make a sudden decision. She gave up patrolling the aisles and walked back to the coat room. She seemed to be rummaging around, and then suddenly there was a crash and a splatter and almost instantly, the entire classroom smelled like Long John Silver and his crew were yo-ho-hoing over bottles of rum. Lots of bottles of rum. Mrs. Baker's voice came out of the coat room. It seems that the crock with Mrs. Kapikoff's pilgrim cider has fallen from the top shelf. Would you please run it and bring Mr. Van Leary? I did. When he came into the classroom, his eyes widened. Smells like a brewery in this classroom, he said. Indeed, said Mrs. Baker. You'll have to air it out after you mop up the cider. You can't stay here with a smell like that, he said. Do you think so, said Mrs. Baker, and she looked at me. Then we shall have to go on a field trip. A field trip, I said. We are going to survey points of local architectural interest. 
I thought for a minute. Are there any? Mrs. Baker had pulled her white sneakers out from her lower desk drawer and she looked up at me. Yes, she said. We walked together to the main administrative office where all the secretaries were scrunched up under their desks. And Mrs. Baker explained to Mrs. Sidman that her classroom smelled like a brewery. She certainly did not think she could keep a student there and she would like to take the opportunity to go on a field trip while Mr. Van Leary cleaned the room. Mrs. Sidman had one eyebrow raised the entire time she was listening, but Mrs. Baker had her arms crossed and you know how convincing that can be. So Mrs. Sidman agreed and Mrs. Baker filled out a form and one of the secretaries crawled out from beneath her desk and called my mother. And then we got into Mrs. Baker's car and she drove me around and showed me all the points of local architectural interest. We crossed over the Long Island Expressway to the north side of town and meandered down side roads until we stopped beside the Quaker Meeting House. This was built in 1676. Think of that, Holling. When it was built, people were still living who had been alive when Shakespeare was alive. 150 years ago, it was a station on the Underground Railroad. Escaped slaves hid right here. We meandered down more side roads. That's the first jailhouse on Long Island, Mrs. Baker said. It has two cells, one for men and one for women. The first man to occupy the cell had stolen a horse. The first woman had refused to pay the church tax because she was not a member of the church. She wanted to find freedom for herself. Think of that. You can see the bars and the windows where she would have looked out. We drove out to the east side of town and circled Hicks Park. This has changed a great deal over the years, but it was once Hicks Common, where the first settlers of the town grazed their cows and sheep. Those larger oaks, no, the oaks hauling over there, were probably saplings then. And the building backing up against the park, that clapboard building there, is St. Paul's Episcopal School where British soldiers were housed during the American Revolution. The silver communion ware it owns was made by Paul Revere, and one of the original Hicks family members hid it in a cellar so it wouldn't be stolen during the war. On the south side of town, we passed Temple Emmanuel. That is the fourth temple on the same site, said Mrs. Baker. The first building was burned by lightning, the second by British soldiers who found the congregation was supporting the revolution, and the third by arsonists. In all those fires, the ark holding the Torah was never damaged. It's still there today. And on to the west, on the far outskirts of town, we drove past what looked like a garden shed. The first abolitionist school, Mrs. Baker said, where Negro children could come to learn to read and write and so escape the ignorance that slavery wanted to impose. Right there, Holling, is the true beginning of the end of slavery. I never knew a building could hold so much inside. On a bright blue day when there wasn't an atomic bomb on any horizon, when the high clouds were painted onto blue canvas, when tulips were standing at attention, and azaleas were blooming, except for the ones in front of the perfect house. Dogs were barking at new smells. I saw my town as if I had just arrived. It was as if I was waking up. You see houses and buildings every day and you walk by them on your way to something else and you hardly see. You hardly notice they're even there, mostly because there's something else going on right in front of your face. But when the town itself becomes the thing that is going on right in front of your face, it all changes. And you're not just looking at a house, but at what's happened in that house before you were born. That afternoon driving with Mrs. Baker, the American Revolution was here. The escaped slaves were here. The abolitionists were here. And I was here. It made me feel sort of responsible. Before we got back to Camillo Junior High, we passed St. Adelbert's, built almost a century ago with the pennies of Italian immigrants, said Mrs. Baker. Let's go in, I said. Mrs. Baker paused. Would your parents approve, she asked. It's a point of local architectural interest, I said. So we went in. It was the first Catholic church I'd ever been inside, mostly because Catholic churches were supposed to be filled with idols and smoking incense that would make you woozy so you'd give in and start praying on your knees, which Presbyterians know is something that should not be done. But it wasn't like that at all. We came in, and Mrs. Baker dropped some money into the offering box, and we walked down the main aisle. The afternoon light slanted down through the high windows so that up close the ceiling Up close to the ceiling, the air was flecked with glowing gold specks. And down below where we were, it was shadowy and warm. I ran my hand over the dark wood of the pews, worn smooth, 
There was no carpet, so we could hear our own footsteps as we walked toward the altar where the crucifix hung suspended, a pale white Christ with bright red wounds. For a hundred years, people had been coming together in this dark, I thought, breathing quietly and evenly for a hundred years. And it made me wonder. Mrs. Baker, I said. Yes, Holling? I have a question. Yes? It doesn't have anything to do with points of local architectural interest. That's all right. After the game at Yankee Stadium, when Mel Stottlemyre took you up to meet the boss, did you ask him to have Kowalski and Associates do the renovations so Merrily could stay? A pause. Whether or not I spoke to about the renovations to Yankee Stadium is not something you need to know, Holly. Now I have a second question. Does this one have anything to do with points of local architectural interest? Yes. What is it? If an atomic bomb drops on Camillo Junior High, everything we've seen today will be gone, won't it? Another long pause. Yes, she said finally. And it really doesn't matter if we're under our desks with our hands over our heads or not, does it? No, said Mrs. Baker. It really doesn't matter. So why are we practicing? And she thought for a minute. Because it gives comfort, she said. People like to think that if they're prepared, that nothing bad can really happen. And perhaps we practice because we feel as if there's nothing else we can do. Because sometimes it feels as if life is governed by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Is there anything else we can do? She smiled. Not a teacher smile. Two things, she said. First, learn to diagram sentences. And it is rude to roll your eyes, Holling. Learn everything you can, everything. And then use all that you have learned to grow up, to be a wise and good man. That's the first thing. As for the second, I lit a candle in a Catholic church for the first time that afternoon. Me, a Presbyterian. I lit a candle in the warm, dark, waxy smelling air of St. Adelbert's. I put it beside the one that Mrs. Baker lit. I don't know what she prayed for, but I prayed that no atomic bomb would ever drop on Camillo Junior High or the Quaker Meeting House or the Old Jail or Temple Emanuel or Hicks Park or St. Paul's Episcopal School or St. Adelbert's. I prayed for Lieutenant Baker missing in action somewhere in the jungles of Vietnam near Kisan. I prayed for Danny Hupfer, sweating it out in Hebrew school right then. I prayed for my sister, driving in a yellow bug toward California, or maybe she was already there, trying to find herself. And I hoped it was okay to pray for a bunch of things with one candle. That afternoon when I came back home, the station wagon was gone, the Mustang was gone, the whole house was empty. Even the mailbox was empty, except for a flyer from my sister, from the Robert Kennedy campaign, announcing he would be stopping on Long Island before the New York primary. My sister would have flipped. And I realized that the biggest part of the empty in the house was my sister being gone. Maybe the first time you know you really care about something is when you think about it not being there. And you know, you really know that the emptiness is as much inside you is outside you. For it so falls out that what we have, we prize not the worth whilst we enjoy it, but being lacked and lost, why? Then we rack the value, then we find the virtue that possession would not show us while it was ours. It's a Shakespeare line, right? You don't know what you have until it's gone. You don't realize how good something is or how awesome something is or how great something is until you don't have it anymore. That's when I knew for the first time, I really did love my sister, but I didn't know if I wanted more for her to come back or for her to find whatever it was she was trying to find. See, this is the kind of stuff you start to think about when you're reading Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. You just can't help being sort of melancholy, even though if you had to play him on stage at the festival theater, at least you'd be a prince and wearing a black cape instead of a fairy wearing yellow tights. And that's why, when my sister called that night long after my mother and father had gone to bed, when she knew that I would be the only one awake to pick up the phone, I started to cry right away. And she did too. Both of us not saying anything, just crying into the telephone. What jerks. Somewhere in between all the crying, I heard she was in Minneapolis. 
which I guess is on the way to California, and that she was alone, and that she had exactly $4 left in her pocket, and that she didn't know what she was going to do since a bus ticket to New York City cost $44.55. And I couldn't ever, 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 ever tell Dad or Mom that she called because she couldn't bear to hear what they would say to her. And she wasn't sure if they would even want to say anything to her, what she was going to do now. I guess she hadn't found herself. Where are you? I said. In the bus station. How else do you think I know a ticket to New York City costs forty-four fifty-five? Is there a Western Union window there? Of course there's a Western Union window here. All bus stations have a Western Union window. If you don't know Western Union, it's a kind of like a bank where you could send money to people. But so it's kind of, yeah, like a pick up cash. People could send it from one city and you could pick it up in another city. So she paused a moment. I guess she was looking around. Hauling? Yes. I don't see a Western Union window here. The operator told us we are almost out of time and should deposit 35 cents for another three minutes. I don't have any more coins, yelled my sister. Get to the nearest Western Union station tomorrow morning. I said quickly, I'll... And then the phone went dead. All because of a stupid 35 cents in coins. Like Bell Telephone was going to go bankrupt because of one phone call from Minneapolis to Long Island in the middle of the night. I didn't know if my sister heard what I said at the end. But the next morning, I was waiting outside the Commerce Bank on, not kidding here, Commerce Street, when it opened at 10 o'clock. This might not sound like a big deal, but if you knew what Commerce Street was only a block over from Lee Avenue, and that I'd been hiding from eyes that would have wondered why I wasn't in Camillo Junior High for the last hour, you'd be impressed. I handed my $100 Salisbury Park saving bond to the teller. Aren't you supposed to be in school, she said. I'm a little worried that an atomic bomb might drop on it, I said. Probably the school will make it through the day, she said. What do you want me to do with this bond? I need to turn it in for cash. She looked at the date. If you turn it in for cash now, you'll only get $52. If you hold on to it in just a few years, it will be worth $100. I don't have a few years, she said. Because of the atomic bomb? No. She turned the savings bond over and looked at it again. Do your parents know that you're cashing this in? Yes, I said. I know, I know, you don't have to tell me. The teller fingered the savings bond. All right, she said finally, $52. I hope you're going to do something worthwhile with the money. I nodded. She counted the bills out onto the counter. Further down on Commerce Street was the Western Union. I put the money on the counter. I need to send all this cash to Minneapolis, he said. Oh, it's going for a visit, is it? The Western Union man said. This is even worse than a teacher joke. This is worse than a nurse joke. I need to send it to my sister. The Western Union man counted it out. That's a lot of money, he said. Where are you sending it exactly? To the Western Union closest to the Minneapolis bus station. Huh, he said, and he pulled out a directory and thumbed through it. it took about half an hour before he found Minneapolis. Well, he said slowly, taking his glasses off. Looks like they've got two bus stations. There's one on Heather Avenue, and there's one on LaSalle. Heather Avenue. I said, send it to the one on Heather Avenue. The Western Union man put his glasses back on. It'll cost you $1.75, he said. Fine. And what's the name of the recipient? I told him, and he took the money and sent $50.25 to Minneapolis, Minnesota, to a Western Union station on Heather Avenue, even though I didn't know if my sister was at that station or if she even knew that the money was coming. I thought of her sitting alone in a place where everyone else was going somewhere or wandering the streets of Minneapolis looking for a way to come home to a place that was emptier without her. Sort of like Hamlet, who more than anything needed to find a home because he sure couldn't find himself. I spent the afternoon hiding around town, which is not easy, since this isn't that big of a town. It would take a lot less than an atomic bomb to make it disappear. And since anyone who saw me might tell the Chamber of Commerce businessman of 1967 or Mrs. Baker, and if either of them heard, well, put me under that bomb. I waited for a call from my sister that night, but it didn't come until late Friday night from Chicago. On the way. On Saturday morning, I told my parents at breakfast that my sister would be at the Port Authority in New York at 10.50 that morning. They looked at me like I had just chanted Hebrew. She'll be at the Port Authority at 10.50, repeated my mother, and her hand was up to her mouth, her eyes suddenly filled. Yes, I said. 
How's she going to get home from there? Asked my father. I guess she was hoping you would go and pick her up. Of course, said my father. Of course, I'll drop everything and pick her up. Of course, I have nothing else to do. He stood up. If she went out in a yellow bug, she can come home in a yellow bug. She's alone, I said. You're not going to see me driving all the way into the city on a Saturday. She can take the train. She may be out of money. Well, whose problem is that? He said. Doesn't matter whose problem it is. She can't get back home unless you go get her, I said. He looked at me. Who do you think you're talking to? He said. She needs help. Then you go get her, Holling. The car keys are up on my dresser. He laughed. Okay, I said. Okay, he said. He went outside to start up the lawnmower. I went upstairs and got the car keys. The Ford Mustang keys, not the station wagon. Holling, said my mother when I came back down. I think he was being sarcastic. I went to the front closet and found my jacket. Holling, what are you doing? I held up the car keys. I'm driving to New York City to pick up my sister from the Port Authority bus terminal at 1050. You don't know how to drive. I've seen movies. I went to the front door. Holling, said my mother. I turned around. You can't drive in by yourself. Then come with me. She looked out to the backyard. We can't do that either, she said. And her voice was as sad and as lost as loneliness. I went out to the garage and sat in the Mustang. The red leather still smelled new. The steering wheel felt right in my hands. It wasn't like I'd never driven before. My mother had let me drive the station wagon around parking lots, the big ones down at Jones Beach, where you can go for two or three miles before you hit anything more dangerous than a seagull. I'd gotten out of first gear plenty of times. I'd even gotten into third gear twice. And the Mustang was smaller and handier than the station wagon. I probably just had to think about turning and the car would feel it. But driving around Jones Beach parking lot is a whole lot different than driving on the Long Island Expressway into New York City. And even if I could get on the expressway, I wouldn't know what exit to get off. Toads, beetles, bats. I came back inside. I threw the keys on the kitchen counter. My mother was putting out a cigarette and starting to make pound cake for lunch. Outside, the mower fussed at the edges of the lawn. I went into the living room and sat down on the couch. And Merrill Lee called. Because her father was going into Yankee Stadium, would I like to come? Can I get to the Port Authority from Yankee Stadium? I said, merrily asked her father. It's too far, but he says if you can leave right now, we'll have just enough time to drop you off. She was quiet a moment. I think he feels like he owes you something, she said. I went into the kitchen. I need money for two train tickets, I said. Two train tickets, my mother said, and money for two lunches. She stared at me. Big lunches, I said. She went upstairs for her pocketbook. I was there when the bus from Chicago pulled in at 10.50. The Port Authority was all noise and rushing. The accumulated combustion of the buses had thickened the air. The whoosh and squeak and hollering of the brakes. The distorted announcements over the PA system and the newsboys hawking this pell-mell of more bodies than belong in any one building gave the place a general roar. As for the floor, you couldn't have found a greater confusion if the ceiling had been lifted off and the sky rained down ticket stubs and newspapers and baby Ruth wrappers. But as soon as the 1050 bus from Chicago parked itself, everything stopped. The rush, the roar, the squeak, the whoosh, they all stopped. Really. Like Leonid Bresnov just sent over an atomic bomb and wiped it all out. They didn't start up again until my sister got off the bus. And she ran out of the diesel combustion right to me we held each other and we were not empty at all. Holling, she said, I was afraid I wouldn't find you. I was standing right here, Heather, I said. I'll always be standing right here. For lunch, we had grilled cheese sandwiches and Cokes and chocolate donuts at the counter at the Port Authority. Outside, we bought pretzels from a stand and then walked to Central Park hand in hand. We lay down in the sheep meadow and my sister told me about driving west with the sun on her face. We got up and rocked around the pond and stopped at an outcropping of boulders that fell out of the woods. Around us was every shade of green you could ever hope to imagine, broken up here and there with a flowering tree blushing to a light pink. All the colors were garbled and reflected in tiny ripples of the water. Then through the wandering paths of the ramble, looking as if we were up in the mountains of California, then across Beth Theta, Beth, Bethesda, there we go, Terrace, where we sat on stone walls and traced carvings with our fingers until someone hollered at us to get off there. 
and back along the mall underneath tall elms until we passed the statue of, no kidding, William Shakespeare, who stared down at us sternly, probably because he was wearing tights and is embarrassed doing that in front of everybody. We walked slowly. He talked a little. I told her about our atomic bomb drills and about the town, and about our town and about the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. She told me about Minneapolis and how she got out of the yellow bug and wouldn't get back in and how Chit drove away and about going to the Western Union and finding the money for the ticket and falling asleep for the first time in two days on the bus to Chicago. But mostly we didn't talk. It was spring in Central Park, and being there with my sister was enough. We took the train out of the city and walked from the station. When we got back home, it didn't matter that my mother had made us burned grilled cheese sandwiches for supper. It was just so good that the house wasn't empty anymore. My father said only one thing during supper. Did you find yourself? What? said my sister. Did you find yourself? She found me, I said. By the end of the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, Laertes is stabbed, the queen is poisoned, the king is poisoned and stabbed, which is pretty much the same thing that happens to Hamlet. By the time it's all over, there are all these dead bodies all over the stage, and even though Horatio is hoping that flights of angels are coming to sing Hamlet to his rest, it's hard to believe that there's any rest for him. Maybe he knew that. Maybe that's why he dressed in black all the time. Maybe it's why he was never happy. Maybe he looked in the wrong places trying to find himself. Or maybe he never had someone to tell him he didn't need to find himself. He just needed to let himself be found. That's what I think Shakespeare was trying to say about what it means to be a human being in the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. And speaking of being found, that's what happened to Lieutenant Baker, too. Really? After almost three months in the jungles of Vietnam, he got found. I was there on the last Wednesday afternoon of May, a cool and blue day when Mrs. Sidman came in with an envelope and handed it to Mrs. Baker. She took it with hands that were trembling. She tore the top slowly open and then stood there holding the telegram, unable to pull it out to read it. Can I help? said Mrs. Sidman, and Mrs. Baker nodded. And then I'll take Holling to my office so you can be alone. Mrs. Baker looked at me, and I knew she wasn't going to send me to Mrs. Sidman's office so she could be alone. You don't send somebody away who lit a candle with you. I suppose not, said Mrs. Baker. Mrs. Sidman took the envelope, then held out the open telegram to Mrs. Baker. But Mrs. Baker closed her eyes. Read it, she whispered. Mrs. Sidman looked at me, then down at the telegram. Then she read the first line. Sweet eyes, stop. Think of the sound you make when you let go after holding your breath for a very, very long time. Think of the gladdest sounds you know, the sound of dawn on the first day of spring break, the sound of a bottle of Coke opening, the sound of a crowd cheering in your ears because you're coming down the last part of the race in your head. You think of the sound of water over stones in a cold stream, the sound of wind through green trees in late May afternoon in Central Park, Think of the sound of a bus coming into the station carrying someone you love. Then put all those together. They would be nothing compared to the sound Mrs. Baker made that day from somewhere deep inside that had almost given up when she heard the first line of that telegram. And then she started to hiccup and to cry and to laugh and Mrs. Sidman put the telegram down, held Mrs. Baker in her arms, nodded to me and took her out of the classroom for a drink of water. And I knew I shouldn't have, but I picked up the telegram and read the rest. Here's what it said. Sweet eyes, stop. Out of jungle, stop. Okay, stop. Home in time for strawberries, stop. Love tie, stop. Shakespeare couldn't write any better than that.